Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. Okay, guys, I tried to uh, do as I was told. I did the Channel 5, uh, you know, the 1666, right? Fire of London. And I reacted to it, and I uploaded it. I tried to. And it got copyright striked in one country, which happened to have been the country that is the focal point of the video, and almost half my audience. And it was Britain. So I'm going to do another one, and let's just... Let's do the next Let best. Let me take you back to London over 350 years ago, in the year 1666. London looks very different to how it does now. We don't have a. I already like her. Back to London over 350 years ago, in the year 1666. Okay. London looks very different to how it does now. We don't have any photos from 1666, but we do have drawings and paintings like this one in the collection of the Museum of London or this one by a Dutch artist called Wenceslaus Holler. You'll see there are no skyscrapers. The tallest buildings are church steeples, which you can see sticking up all over the city. And there are sailing ships on the Thames with tall masts hey. and rigging. Oh, uh, that's the that's the bridge that. I learned about on Jay Foreman, Map Man, right? It's like a bridge, but with a bunch of housing and buildings on it. And when you, there are Sorry. sailing ships on the Thames with tall masts and rigging. And when you walk down the streets, instead of jeans and t-shirts, the people around you are dressed like this. And instead, the people around you are dressed like this. this. And instead of living in tower blocks, everyone lives in houses like this. In the 17th century, most people would have lived in houses like this in London. This is Staple Inn in Hoburn. There's not many of these buildings left anymore for obvious reasons. And what you can see is that it's made out of wood. Now, wood burns a lot easier than a brick house. But the reason you want a wood house is because it's a lot cheaper and faster to build a wooden house than a brick one. And if you're building your own house, that is an important consideration. Yep. And secondly, you can build each floor floor a little bit bigger than the one underneath and you can see that they've done that here each floor sticks out a little bit over the road and if you do that for six stories on both sides of the road you're going to end up closing the top of the road off there are stories from the time about people being able to lean out of their upper story windows and shake the hand of the neighbor on the other side of the street You'd think you'd have to worry about the building getting top heavy. Um, uh, they know that means that fire can cross from one side of the street to the other oh. really easily. Now, there is a problem with these houses, and that's that they don't have electricity yet. Now, when we think about homes before electricity, we often think about candles, but a big problem is ovens. Like, you can't bake anything or cook anything unless you have an open fire in your house. And something that needs a lot of ovens is a bakery. So that's where we start our story. In a bakery on Pudding Lane. Chapter Guys, that was actually a really good uh, overhanging. Oh, I didn't realize. Just great storytelling. How like being able to. The tops of buildings being so close. How you could see how that could be a big issue. One. For the fire. Fire starter. Apologies if the camera is a little bit shaky. Sorry, I'm going to give her a subscribe. I'm very cold and I'm shivering a little bit. Uh, but I want to take you back to September the 2nd, 1666. Uh, behind Day me right my now birthday. is a very modern concrete building, but in 1666 there would be a bakery here owned by a man called Thomas Farriner. Thomas Farriner went to bed one night. We don't know exactly what happened in his bakery, but downstairs somewhere a spark caught. We don't know if he left a candle burning or if he left his oven on, but he woke up in the middle of the night to find that his house was full of smoke and he couldn't get down the stairs so he and his family had to jump out of their upper story window their maid refused to jump and she was the first casualty of the fire and the fire starts to spread really quickly for a couple of reasons not as some people will tell you because everyone had is there some psychological answer behind that why does why are some people more so there are two very you know instinctual 
guttural things of being afraid of fire and of heights, you know? And I wonder why that some people, the, the fear of jumping actually overrides the fear of burning, which I would think would always not be the case. Thatched roofs. Thatched roofs have been bad. I gotta stop interrupting. I, I'll shut up. Jeez, I drank way too much coffee. Stop me. And the fire starts to spread really quickly for a couple of reasons. Not, as some people will tell you, because everyone had thatched roofs. Thatched roofs have been banned in London hundreds of years before this because of fires. And in fact, most people did not have thatched roofs at this time. Um, the reason the fire spreads is partly because everyone's house is made out of wood. And the summer has just been a really hot one. So the wood in everyone's houses is really dry and it's like kindling. Partly it spreads because it just happens to be really windy that day. And that pushes the fire around faster than people can put it out. And partly it spreads quickly because it starts in the middle of the night and everyone who could be around to put it out is asleep. One person who's asleep is Sam. So perfect storm scenarios, obviously. Samuel out is asleep. One person who's asleep is Samuel Peeps. Now, his name is spelled Pepis, but it's pronounced Peeps, I promise. Samuel Peeps was a bigwig. Like literally he had a big wig. Musician. In the Admiralty, which was a bit like the Navy, but today he's famous for keeping a diary about the 1660s, where he writes down some really good details about what he and his rich, important friends were up to in London during this time. Side note, Samuel Pepys wrote his diaries in code. He did a lot of stuff that he didn't want his wife to find out about. So he replaces a lot of English words with French words or Italian words. Is that the 17th century equivalent of having a second cell phone? Words, or words that sound French and Italian but aren't. And then he writes the whole thing not in cursive but in shorthand. So it didn't get translated until the 19th century. And while you might expect his diary to have looked like this, it actually looks like this. I was going to pause to see if I could read it, but I'll... Uh, Jane. What could it mean? 1659? 1660. If you're looking to follow in Peep's footsteps, his house is gone, but you can still visit his street, which was Seething Lane, and you can visit his parish church, St. Olav's, and there's a blue plaque on the site where he was born in Salisbury Court near St. Paul's Cathedral. I'm going to add all of these to a Google map linked below so you can visit these places for yourself. Anyway, Samuel Pepys's maid, Jane, wakes him up in the middle of the night to tell him that there is a fire happening in the city. And he goes to his window and he looks out and he can see it in the distance. And he says, ah, oh, it's just a little one. That'll be out by morning. Nothing to worry about. I heard that in the one I watched the other day that I couldn't upload. Uh, eh, it's fine. <laughs> And he goes back to bed. When he wakes up again in the morning, 300 houses have been burned down. Look at that. And he ain't seen nothing yet. Chapter 2. Panic. People start to panic and they start trying to move their belongings out of the way of the fire. Samuel Pepys, very famously, has a wedge of Italian cheese that he buries in his garden to save it, along with some wine and some other bits and bobs. It's a good indicator of what he thought was precious, uh, although he doesn't record ever going back for it, so who knows if it worked. Uh, maybe he just invented cheese fondue, who Still knows? There. And it's not just peeps. Uh, he says he sees other people throwing their things into the river rather than have them burn. And people sit in boats on the Thames with all their belongings, watching the fire on the bank, waiting for it to burn out. As the fire gains ground, temperatures reach up to 1,700 degrees Celsius, and the iron gates of the city start to melt. And finally, the fire reaches St. Paul's Cathedral. Now, St. Paul's Cathedral is built out of stone, so it's safe. In fact, Londoners know. I wonder if any, like, parish, like, hardcore priests... That doesn't sound right. Hardcore priests. Um... 
like decide to like go down with the ship, like not leave the cathedral. It's safe. It's survived out of stone, so it's safe. In fact, Londoners know it's safe. It's survived fires in the past, and so they've put their things what? in the cathedral to save them. But this time, there's some building work going on at St Paul's, and, and the tower the scaffolding is covered in wooden scaffolding. And it's that scaffolding that catches fire during 1666. According to eyewitness accounts, the stones of St. Paul's got so hot that they exploded. And the lead from the roof runs down the, the street in a river. That's how you burn down a stone building. Chapter 3. Firefighting. So where's the fire? burns a lot easier Oh my than god. Uh, thank you so much for having timestamps. Um, I asked this question in the video I couldn't upload. When, because, fi you know, fi fighting fires has probably been a thing since people started living in cities, since civilization, right? So I wonder what I would be curious. It would be, I feel like it'd be interesting to learn about the history of firefighting. Um, knowing how much of a problem it could be, especially in close together wooden plate wooden cities and uh, i'd like to see how it kind of progressed and any inventions they might have made or something or maybe they would build certain important things next to you know i, I don't know just how it evolved firefighting so where's the fire brigade well in 1666 there is no fire brigade yet everybody is expected to pitch in um, the parish will keep some firefighting tools on hand for you, but you've got to do it yourself. Uh, now, these days we might think about putting the fire out with water, right? And that does happen, especially if you're near the river or if you're near a well. But not everybody is. And even if you are, there aren't any rubber hoses yet. So you can only put as much water on the fire as will fit in a bucket and it's going to be so if hot your whole house is on fire throw it that's not going to do very much what's a much more effective firefighting tool is creating fire breaks if you have a whole row of houses that are burned you destroy one in the middle and that means at least the fire can't get any further and fire uh, firefighters know that this works really well. They've done it before and it's worked. And so Londoners will keep things called fire hooks around so that they can pull houses down when oh. they need to. So imagine you're living on a street and you can see the fire at one end of the street and it's coming towards you. You gotta pick a house to pull down. You don't want your house to be the one that gets pulled down, right? Like you want your neighbor's house to get pulled down. So, there is one person who has the authority to order the pulling down of houses, and that is the Lord Mayor, Thomas Bloodworth. And he doesn't come out of this situation looking great, to be honest. Um, so I'm just thinking, like, hey, here's a little extra money, don't tear down mine. Samuel Pepys says that he's walking around the city on the second day, and he can't see any firefighting efforts going on. And so he has to go over the Lord Mayor's head to the king. I I got so upset. For, I thought he was about to say he couldn't see fire anywhere near. Well, that was the problem. And, going on. and so he has to go over the Lord Mayor's head to the king. And the king has to order him to do his job. Um, we think that actually he might have fled the city partway through the fire. Because we don't hear anything about him after the second day. What reason did and he have to end, flee? It's people like Charles II, the king, and his brother, the Duke of York, who step up and organize fire breaks to be put in place. Well, why flee? You, what pressure were you under? You had to pick a house. In the end, it's not really human effort that puts out the fire. Just it's it the sizzles. fact that the wind dies down. And once the fire isn't getting pushed around as fast, it's a lot easier to get around it and create the fire breaks and put water on it to get it out. In the end, the fire burns for around five or six days, depending on who you ask. 13,200 houses have been burned down. 87 churches, four prisons. It never rained. Or maybe it did rain and just not hard enough to put it out. 
In terms of human casualties, most sources from the time put the number under 10, weirdly enough, uh, usually around six or seven. So people got um, the heck out of it. Now, them. historians have debated the accuracy of those numbers. Like, surely that can't be right. Uh, there must have been homeless people and single people who weren't being counted. We know that the fire in... I feel like if you're homeless or single, you have even less stuff to grab, especially your kids and stuff like that, or your wife, or and you'd be like first to be able to be like, all right, I have, I'm out of here. You know, I feel like the the people with the most to lose in the fire would be most likely to make mistakes that get them killed. Certain places was hot enough to burn bones, so there wouldn't necessarily be any human remains. But on the other hand. We don't have a huge spike in burials at this time, and there aren't a lot of records of Auntie Margaret who died in the fire, as there were, for example, for the plague a year beforehand. And after the fire... What plague happened in 1665? People start looking around for someone to blame. Chapter 4. Was it terrorists? Now, some people think that this is God's punishment for London's sins. What those sins are depends on who you ask, but a lot is made at the time of the fact that the fire... Nothing can just have it. ...begins on Pudding Lane and supposedly finishes on Pie Corner. London is being punished for the sin of gluttony. And at Pie Corner, which is between Cop Lane and Giltspur Street, you can still go there... I'm beyond the point of wanting to face Palm. And at Pie Corner, which is between Cop Lane and Giltspur Street, will look you can still go there anything. to this day. And they have a little monument of a golden cherub. And he's a little bit chubby to remind Londoners not to be so gluttonous ever again. And of course, some people think it's terrorists. The terrorist threat in this period is thought to come from Catholics. Whether that's English Catholics or French Catholics WMDs. or the Dutch... Uh, the Dutch don't tend to be Catholics, but we don't like them very much anyway. And one Frenchman actually confesses to starting the fire. His name is Robert Hubert, and there's a trial. And they find out that he wasn't in London when the fire started. The judge thinks he's mad, Oh! but he hangs him anyway. For a second, I thought, because there's, you know, so the British... French rivalry over centuries is that maybe he was in France and said, ha ha. Yeah, that was me. Gotcha. Or, but he actually went to trial, which means he either left France to go there or he was already in London. In which case, why hand yourself in? That makes absolutely no sense. He was definitely insane. And when his body is brought down from the scaffold, Londoners are so furious that they rip his body to pieces. Chapter 5. Rebuilding. Officially, the king, Charles II, decides it was an act of God, and he puts his efforts into rebuilding. And why'd you kill he the guy? He ensures that this is never going to happen again by putting lots of new laws in place. So, for example, you're not allowed to build your house out of wood anymore. You have to build it out of brick or stone. Oh. Oh. Just build it out of stone, you peasants. We can't afford that, sir. Well... If you try and build your new house out of wood, the king's men will turn up at your house and pull it down. Start again. Do it in brick this time. I don't have brick. But building out of brick is slow and expensive, and people just want a new house as quickly as possible. Skill issue. And... There's no fire insurance yet, so probably all your money was in your house that burned down. The king puts an architect called Sir Christopher Wren in charge of the rebuilding effort. And he builds lots of new churches in London, including this one right here, St Paul's Cathedral. Now, it looks really different to a lot of our English cathedrals, and that's because of this rebuilding effort. Most of our cathedrals have towers or spires. This one has a dome. It's built in the fashionable new Baroque style. 
Abraham. And Christopher Wren doesn't just want to build new churches. He oh, also man. wants to change the street layout of London. He wants to completely start from scratch and make these big, wide, straight roads with boulevards, a little bit like Paris today. Uh, but in the end, he can't make it happen. There are just too many landowners in London. It is too piecemeal. So he doesn't get his way on the streets. Um, to piecemeal. He gets his churches instead. To this day, there are dozens of churches by Christopher Wren all over London, and he really gave London a very distinct character. Finally, after the fire... Nothing in New England is original. Hmm. The architecture is taken from New from England. The name is taken from England. Every town is taken from England, and I'm not over it. People decide it would be a rather good idea to invent insurance for this sort of thing, where everybody pays into a pot, and if your house gets burned down, you get the money in the pot to rebuild with. The first person to try this out is the excellently named Nicholas, if Jesus Christ had not died for thee, thou hadst been damned, Barbon. I'm not even kidding. That I freaking hate my house. I don't have enough to rebuild it, though, into a renovate it. Light it on fire. Everyone will chip in. That was in. his real name. Um, by 1700, insurance companies had their own... You know, remember that time where I said I'd shut up and stop pausing? Like two minutes ago. Had not died for thee, thou hadst been damned, Barbon. I'm not even kidding. That was his real name. Nice. Um, by 1700, insurance companies had their own fire brigades, and you'd get a little plaque to put on your house to prove you were insured. And if your house was on fire, the fire brigade from your insurance company would turn up. And if you had one of their plaques, they'd put out your fire. And if you didn't, they'd drive off and leave you to it. Your entire house is in flames. Sorry, the person who paid, uh, you know, they burnt down their curtain. We gotta go there. Somewhere around 80,000 people are made homeless by the fire. And without anywhere else to go, they camp in the fields around London. The king organizes bread to be brought to feed them, and charitable donations pour in from all over the country. But some of them are still out there a year later. Thank you for watching this episode of the London really History good. Show. As always, I'm going to be adding the places we visited today onto a map linked in the description. So you can go to these places for yourself, and if you click on the pin, the video will pop up. Um, we went into lockdown halfway through making this episode, so one thing I was really reliant on was photos released under Creative Commons licenses on Wikipedia, because I couldn't go out and take my own photos. So thank you to all the photographers listed here, and indeed anyone who puts their work on Wikipedia for free. Thank you again, and I'll see you next time. See, everything happens for a reason. If, I, if that uh, previous video didn't get declined in the UK... I wouldn't have found this channel, and this is in. Oh, this is a better video. This is really good. All right, guys, I love y'all. It isn't weird to say that. Thank you for everything you do and for watching along with me. And I'd love to see your comments. All right, I gotta do live so I can actually watch with you. See you guys next time. Bye.